I received a lot of questions for this Q&A, so I've divided them into two rough categories. The first lot of questions relate to things you yourselves might make use of, and they are first so that you don't have to watch this whole video if you're not interested in the second category, which is personal questions about me. I've also co-opted the voices from a few friends, links to whose work you'll find in the description below in the order that they appear. Let's begin. What will your next video be? This one. What books do you recommend for conlang research? These are some that I dip into. A mix of natlang textbooks and teach yourself books, stuff by Mark Rosenfelder and etymologies. Also read academic papers, which I'm usually supplied by people on the ZBB or on the R Conlang's Discord server with. What natlings inspire you? Languages, like people, are complex. Each one has its charms. I've not explored too widely, but some that come to mind are Navajo, Mohawk, Hungarian, Russian, Moroccan Dedija, and Kwekwe. And there are many I haven't listed here, and countless more I have yet to meet. What sources inspire your world building? This is hard to answer because I don't think of myself as much of a world builder. But the, the things I have made, I suppose they stem from reading about the world, history, cultures, ideas, and from examining my own life and then considering how elements from one culture or time might manifest in another culture or time, how my own life might be different with the presence of one of these elements from another culture or time, or how my own life might be different, absent of some current element or other. It helps too, besides reading what is and what was, to read about what might be. I ask myself, what if, a lot. How can I keep track of my conlang and stuff? I have three places. The computer, which holds many iterations of roughly the same material in Excel and Google Docs. A notebook for sketches of ideas, concepts and constructions, most of which end up unused. And in my mind, the least reliable place, but easiest to access. And a good place to mull conlanging questions when idling time in a queue. If you're ever in a post office and you hear someone practicing co-articulations of clicks, it's probably me. How do you choose overhead goals regarding aesthetics and features? This question to me feels a bit like asking someone, how do you choose what to eat at a restaurant? Most people will say, I choose what I like, and I will say the same about choosing aesthetics and features. I choose them simply because I like them. However. I recognise that one cannot always choose what one wants if there are outside constraints. In the restaurant scenario, I might be on a date, so I don't want to order anything too oniony. Not that that's ever stopped me in the past, however. And in the field of conlangs, you might uh, likewise be constrained. Not too alienating for non-linguisticians, pronounceable by a wide range of people, and so on. But for me, I simply choose what I like, regardless of the onions. What would you like to see more often in conlangs? What things or questions do you think are often overlooked in conlangs? I'm not sure that my opinion is particularly valuable in this regard, but, seeing as you've asked, it would be nice to see more recognition that vowels are like electrons. An inventory like this probably actually allows these vowels to be realised anywhere within these clouds of definition. Consonants do this too. Effectively, this all boils down to the idea of contrast, for which I'll read an excerpt from the foreword of a book called A Linguistic Guide to Language Learning by William Gamwell Moulton. Contrast is an essential condition of human experience. It is only in comparison with heat that we recognise cold, only by bitter the sweet. Recognition of this simple fact is the key both to modern linguistics and to modern criticism. In linguistics, it makes use of such concepts as distinctive contrast and complementary distribution, in criticism of tension, paradox, and irony. But the principle is the same. No fish ever discovered water, and no monolingual speaker ever understood the unique qualities of his own language. Unique does not mean good. I think conlangers on the whole would make better work if they tried less often to be unique with their creations. Being unique won't make your conlang good, but if your conlang is good, chances are it'll end up unique. Or, put more broadly, if you pursue success, you'll always be a step behind. But pursue excellence, and success will chase you. I think conlangers can get hung up on phonetic inventories, phonotactics, and every subtle nuance of allophony. I imagine, perhaps wrongly, that this stems from the fact that these areas are familiar, 
so we tend to linger in them before venturing out to the colder climes of syntax and pragmatics. Put on a jacket, grab a thermos and strike out. Phonology by no means needs to be complete before starting on other bits of the language. I'd like to see greater variation in the lexicons of conlangs, which tend to lack both highly specific and highly vague words. These words are the most fun, in my opinion, and ultimately your language will be composed of and characterised by its words. Coming off that last point, I notice that people tend to translate things into their conlines while keeping them in the same lexical category. Father, which is a noun in English, they translate as a noun, father. Well, why not make it a verb instead? Or why not translate the concept of blue, which is an adjective in English, as a verb to be blue, or a noun that needs to be possessed by the thing it describes? Furthermore, actions which I describe as having multiple elements tend to be translated wholesale. Consider swim, drown, and boil. All of these verbs contain an element of water, so instead of giving each a separate root, why not have them be composed of pairs of verbs? Swim might be be in water plus go, drown might be be in water plus kill, boil might be be in water plus cook. Just something to think about. A lot of translations tend to be very highfalutin, with names like The Saga of Xanthu, Tragic Warrior, or The Song of the Moon Priestess, which is all very well. But I'd like to see translations of more mundane scenarios like Hey, hey, how's it going? Yeah, good, you? Yeah, all good. Just saw Xanthu on the way here. Do you remember when he- Oh my god, yeah, that was hilarious. Yeah, I laughed my head off. I've still got the bruise. What's Xanthu up to now then? He's become a moon priestess, actually. These sorts of things show how the language exists as used in an everyday fashion by its speakers, full of interruptions and unconscious speech patterns, like, oh my god. So many people merely say this out of surprise, regardless of their actual religious inclinations. But that's merely a personal preference. Embrace ambiguity. Real languages do this all the time. Context is a great power that is sorely overlooked. It's okay for things to be unclear except from context. In conlangs, I've rarely come across a distinction drawn between words that exist and words that are used. Like in English, the word gleet exists, but effectively no one uses it. It might be cool to see more gleet in conlangs. Why don't you have more subscribers? Watch any of my videos to the very end, and I think you'll find out. What languages do you speak? Right, I'll try and do this in a single take. So, I speak English very well, thanks to all the practice my parents gave me growing up, and I grew up speaking a dialect of Chinese, but I've forgotten all of it now, so I'm not sure that that really counts. Je peux parler un petit peu en français parce que à l'école c'était obligatoire d'apprendre le français. Я могу говорить чуть-чуть на русском языке, потому что когда я был ребенком, я очень хотел работать с космонавтом. И для этого я начал изучать русский язык свои в свободное время, самостоятельно, с книгами и так далее. И сейчас, очевидно, я не космонавт, но я могу говорить с людьми об обычных и ежедневных предметах. Дарсту ла арбет ал фуса фил гамиа. Ва... Uh, لمدة أربع سنوات ولذلك يمكنني أن أتكلم بها uh, الآن شوية وعشت في المغرب ثمانية شهور ودكشي علاش قلت قدر نحضر شوية بالدرجة لكن ماشي بزاف وربي مجهد توري هندي أردو عادي هاي كونكي ماني هندي بحر حي كي أونيورسيتي ما أنو uh, how do you get into conlang? As the previous question shows, I grew up in a multilingual environment, and throughout my childhood was interested in all kinds of codes and ciphers, ranging from semaphore to alchemical symbols all of which are ways of packaging information. I never read, and still have not read, the works of Tolkien concerning Middle-earth, and I have watched and read none of Games of Thrones. And Star Trek is something I watched my first episode of about a year ago. Strangely enough, I think the first brush I had with constructed languages was from Star Wars Episode Four: A New Hope, with the scene indelibly inked into the parchment of my mind of the chat between Han Solo and Greedo. Intrigued, I used the internet to look up what language it was. Turns out, it's a modified version of Quechua called Hatiz, the ostensible lingua franca for the criminal underworld in the Star Wars universe, and I even found a pretty sizable word list. 
but what I could not find was the grammar, so I did what any child with a yen for languages would do. I made it up. I made it Rhodian, and in hindsight it was more or less a, more or less a poor relex of English with a couple of cool quirks, and to this day I still remember words and phrases from it. I think around a similar time I started to learn Khoi Khoi, a language spoken in Namibia, and I remember writing a short story that included some untranslated dialogue in a gibberish inspired by it that obviously included some clicks. I had also read A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, and for a project in English class I created my own slang akin to NADSAT, but instead of being based on Russian it was based on a mix of other languages, notably Italian and Japanese. From there, snippets kept featuring in short stories, which is my central hobby really, and a great many scripts and sketches were made, and the rest, as they say, is history, helped along by constant play and exposure to other languages. I'd be remiss if I left out the influence of Mark Rosenfeld's language construction kit, online as it was only at the time, which was vast. Have you made languages other than Alpine Neptune? For sure. There was the aforementioned Rhodian, a language called Skjord I made up with a friend at school that operated on a quadrilateral consonant root basis, another called Wahara that had a pretty interesting case system, and numerous nameless sketches. Most, if not all, of that documentation has been lost, however, due to a mixture of a stolen computer and a poor habit of writing ideas on loose slips of paper. Alpine Neptune is a project I've reworked multiple times, and it is my only current one, with one other as a seedling in my mind. Will you make more showcases in the future? For sure. I intend to redo the Alpine Neptune one, and make short separate videos that focus on one or two aspects of it at a time. And I might outline my seedling idea too. Do you plan to make a Discord server? Unless someone puts forth a cogent argument as to doing so, no. I have no plans to make a Discord server. Are you working on any world-building projects with your conlangs? I enjoy conlanging in of itself, and only world-build insofar as it is related to the background or evolution of the language, and any elements that require being made up for the sake of the stories that my languages find themselves in. I'm currently undertaking no processes to create a world. What inspired you to make YouTube videos? Did anyone help you start to make them? I think making my first video, the not very good Alpine Neptune teaser showcase, arose from my time at Conlang's university, and the feeling that if I put some stuff into a video then I'd stop fiddling with the basic grammar and phonology. As it turns out, I was entirely wrong, as Alpine Neptune has been thoroughly revised since then. Serendipitously, however, I discovered that I really, really enjoy making videos. So I started making more, and now, here we are, where we are. Regarding whether anyone helped me start to make them, the answer is a resounding no. The Alpine Neptune teaser trailer was the first time I used iMovie, as might be evident, and my videos are honestly just glorified powerpoints. How do you keep the motivation of posts? It's difficult to be unmotivated if you love what you do. But more broadly, I think a willingness to be wrong and be critiqued probably helps too. Could you, at the beginning, share your projects with family or friends? In the beginning, I had no desire to do so. It was a private pastime, a secret vice. I had the good fortune to have a friend at school similarly interested in languages, so we conlanged together for a bit. Nowadays, my family and friends know that I conlang, but aren't interested in it, and see it as a harmless eccentricity. And that's it. There were some other questions, broadly along the lines and variations of what is your favourite X, but I've decided not to answer them because I'm sure I've taken up enough of your time today. So, just quickly, thank you to my patrons, and as always, don't like and don't subscribe.